everyone. Um, I'm Diane Grunick, and I'm here at Stanford. And our panel is Advanced Energy Efficiency. Um, can we close? That would be great. And we have an awful lot we're going to cover, so I'm not doing introductions um, other than to say our first person is going to be uh, Greg Wickler, who's at Navigant and has done the world's most comprehensive study. It just came out um, last week, or this yep. week, week, on um, what is the potential for energy efficiency. And while it's focused on California, it is applicable certainly throughout the United States um, and in developed countries, because, and it really uh, breaks ground in terms of thinking about how we can understand areas of energy efficiency. Um, then we're going to move with to Lauren, who was a longtime um, uh, senior management at Clear Results, one of our um, premier consulting energy efficiency companies, and now has her own company. And she's going to be talking about some of the innovations that she's bringing in as a practitioner implementer in the field. And then last but not least is Kurt, who is the executive director of the Global Cool Roofs Alliance, which is white and other cool um, surfaces. So do we have an ability to get started? Um, not, not with the slides. I'm trying to get it to work. <laughs> but. Um, Greg, can you, without slides, at least introduce your potential yes. study? Yes. I can. Sit down. I might have to move. When it comes on, let me know if I'm blocking the screen. Okay. Yeah, I can. I can. Um, if it helps. I can move over here. I can also sit down there. No. Yeah. Um, I've learned. Why don't you get started talking about yeah. it, and then we'll worry about it later on. Okay. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, it's great to be here. Um, th I'm so glad it's Friday. Um, this has been one heck of a week. <laughs> It He's seems, given not one, but two, three workshops. Three workshops. It was every day there was something going on. Uh, but certainly happy that it's Friday and no, happy to be talking that, about uh, uh, a, a really great topic, which is uh, um, energy efficiency potential, uh, an area that I've been working on for many years. As, as, uh, thank you, Diane, for uh, uh, um, mentioning such wonderful accolades about uh, the potential study that I'm going to talk about today. Um, if we get the slides up, that would be great, but... Um, it would be good. <laughs> <laughs> if not. Uh, but I'm just going to start speaking, and then I will, I will just get into the slide that uh, appears uh, at that point. So what I wanted to... Keep going. Yeah, Keep yeah. Going. what I wanted to speak about uh, was uh, initially just give you a sense about where California is in terms of energy efficiency. <laughs> Number um, one, I hope. Number one, uh, we've shared, so we, uh, we've been, we, there's a ranking that the American Council for Energy Efficiency Economy, ACEEE, does every year. And uh, California actually was ranked um, number one for many, many years. Then we kind of lost the ranking to, I think, Massachusetts um, for a while. But we're back at number one. Um, I think one of the things, and folks may have heard, uh, uh, about the Rosenfeld effect, which is this curve of per capita energy use. Um, California has maintained a flat curve of per capita energy use relative to the rest of the country, and we credit that to, to um, our pioneer in the field, uh, our, uh, Art Rosenfeld, who sadly passed away earlier this year. Um, and much of that success of energy efficiency in California can be attributed to programs that utilities uh, have been implementing for 30 plus years. Um, so energy efficiency accomplishments largely, uh, largely credited from the utility program efforts uh, that uh, PG&E, SoCal Edison, uh, and uh, San Diego Gas and Electric and the other utilities have, uh, have implemented over those years. Um, so one of the things that is also really worth noting is that there's legislation, there's policies in place that are really strong of, and supportive of energy efficiency. One of those policies is uh, SB 350, Senate Bill 350, that the governor signed a, about a year plus ago um, that is essentially, among other things, aimed at uh, doubling the uh, uh, efficiency that we do pretty much now by 2030. So we are on the path to doubling 
our energy efficiency activities in 2030. So how are we going to get there? And that's I'll, a big, I'll that's a big question. I'll let you know when it comes up. <laughs> it yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I just wanted to note that nationally, energy efficiency has also been on the rise. And this is kind of an interesting you know, statement to make in light of where we're at in terms of our politics um, right now with, uh, with climate change and uh, energy efficiency is, hasn't, hasn't necessarily been a priority of the current uh, oh, administration. Not quite, but we've located you. There you are. So page, uh, page three, please. And why don't you get a why don't you move over to the lectern? Yeah. So transition time. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Thank you, Jim. Okay. Three. A master of many talents. Are you okay sitting in one of the seats? It might be easier to do this. Uh, I you sure? This, this works, yeah. too. You can easily oh, do that. Can that can can see see oh, yeah, if you'd like. Lauren, if you want to just sit. Well, I am going to move to the yeah, seat. Yeah, we'll just oh, right, sit so here. Okay. I can actually see. All right, so uh, this is where I'm at um, in terms of nationally energy efficiency has, uh, has played an important role. Spending is an indicator. Um, in 2015, nationwide um, utilities and states have spent about $6 billion uh, and achieved about 0.7% of total sales reduction, which is a pretty impressive amount uh, that amounts to 26 billion kilowatt hours of savings in that year. Um, but the message, I think, it's the important message is even in, in, in spite of where the political situation is right now, there's room to, to improve on that number and that amount. We see signs of that. There are several states that have very aggressive uh, energy efficiency policies in place. I say the states because the states are going to continue down that path. California is one of them, New York, um, some, some of the other states here in the West, Oregon, Washington, um, and uh, 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 several others that are going to continue to uh, enhance and expand their energy efficiency efforts. Um, so as Diane mentioned, um, we have been doing energy efficiency potential work. Uh, this is for the state of California, the California Public Utilities Commission. And Navigant has actually been doing this study for the CPUC for uh, several years now, about six years. Uh, and um, we... Um, what, what the CPUC uses those, uh, those studies for is to essentially set goals for the utilities to accomplish savings in the next program cycle. Um, so as, as Diane mentioned uh, last week, the CPUC released our latest draft of the, uh, of, of the potential estimates. And um, what we found is that if we just kind of go with the existing policies that are in place at the CPUC, um, we're not going to actually see any more potential. In fact, we're going to see less potential than what we have seen in previous years. And we realized as we were doing our study that, gosh, that's not consistent with current policies. So we really have to think about um, some uh, other scenarios of our analysis to in increase the uh, uh, projections for savings. So we went down this path of doing some scenarios saying, what if we were to really be aggressive in, in our policies how much potential could we extract? So I wanted to talk about that a little bit, at least set the stage for some discussion. So here's the result. A uh, little bit small print uh, for you all to read in the back there. Um, the, I will provide a link to the, uh, um, to the potential study in case anybody's um, interested in diving into the details. Um, about in our reference case, that's the case where we're about, you know, I'd say 20% lower than uh, the potential that we've estimated in the previous cycles. That equates to about 2,600 uh, gigawatt hours per year. I have megawatt hours there. That's actually a typo. Um, and if you think about the aggressive scenario, we would get up to about 3,500 uh, uh, gigawatt hours uh, per year. So a, a significant um, bump up in the, if we just assume or imagine, well, what if we were to change the policies some of those changes include, let's look at a different way for measuring the economic uh, uh, value of the, uh, of the energy efficiency. So changing the, the economic test perspective, um, looking at carbon as a, avoided carbon as a benefit, whereas in the current methodology, we don't look at that. Um, looking at um, increasing incentives and, and um, 
whatever opportunities we can get to incentivize and motivate customers to participate at greater levels of energy efficiency. Um, and you know, the, I think the, uh, um, the, um, the, the bulk of the savings uh, that we, we see come from two different areas. So one is utility-based programs, and this chart here just shows what is the uh, uh, sort of the, the possible potential areas of savings. So one of them is utility-based programs. I think those are the, uh, um, the, 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 dark, uh, the, the dark gray bars. And then the second area is uh, um, what's called behavior um, uh, retro commissioning and uh, operational efficiency, what is referred to as BROS in California parlance. So those two areas, those two upper upper areas are really where the, the greatest opportunities lie for uh, expansion. The, the lower bars uh, you'll see are consistent across the different scenarios. Um, those are for codes and standards and for uh, low income programs, which are fairly uh, consistently predictable in terms of how much impact could be achieved through those different, uh, through those different mechanisms. Um, Looking at the savings from a percent of total sales perspective, so you recall from a previous slide, I had that 0.7% reduction in 2015 nationwide. So that comparable number is, is illustrated in this chart here for the different scenarios. So looking at savings as a percent of the electric sales under the aggressive scenario, we get up to 1.2% of reduction relative to total electric sales by 2030. So the, you know, the, the, uh, the question is, under that, and so that's under the aggressive scenarios. So the question is, well, is that enough? Is that enough to reach our goals, our aggressive uh, targets to uh, essentially meet the SB 350 reduction goals? And the answer is no, it's actually not. Um, we're mm -hmm. still quite a bit short. In fact, we should be at 1.5, 1.6, 1.7. Um, and so the, the, the questions that I kind of pose to our, you know, our discussion today is, well, how are we going to reach that doubling goal? What, what is it going to take to kind of get us to a point in the state where we actually could see the savings or realize the savings that are uh, essentially stipulated in this, uh, in this legislation? And what's really going to have to happen from a market and policy standpoint to get us to that, to that level? So I have some ideas. I'll just throw out some, a few ideas here. Um, from a policy perspective, um, we we have a lot of we have a lot of rules um, in terms of how energy efficiency is is uh, is essentially governed by the uh, by by the the policies that are put into place. So we really have to revisit a lot of policies that I would argue kind of inhibit um, customers to participate in energy efficiency programs. Um, some of you may have heard of the the notion of free ridership. Um, deemed baseline, so it's, there's a lot of things that the, the uh, Public Utilities Commission rules have been put into place to say, well, you can't claim those savings because people would have done it anyway. Well, how do you determine that? That's a kind of a, a subjective, uh, su subjective question. Um, you could allow more energy efficiency measures to be counted than what we, are, we were allowed to look at in our study. Um, so that could be um, more behavior-based measures. It could be uh, industrial measures that are really now considered to be industry standard practice. Um, and then we could look at uh, additional benefits or different test perspectives, like uh, using a societal cost test or at least uh, capturing the added benefit of a reduced kilowatt hour in terms of carbon savings. Um, we should also think about de uh, delivery of the energy efficiency programs and really try to get more innovative in terms of our delivery approaches. So one of the things that the, the PUC has been looking at in the current proceeding is uh, whether it's better to have third parties to have you know, the, in the value of the, uh, of, of, of the industry actually uh, um, uh, help um, uh, harvest more of those savings. So third party performance uh, uh, approaches that are not necessarily uh, uh, as well embraced right now. Um, there might be some other, other models around end use services. So thinking about how to change the, you know, the, the nature of how um, it's not delivering kilowatt hours, but maybe it's delivering services like lighting 
uh, HVAC service um, that might uh, remove some barriers that are currently in place. <laughs> Looking at, you know, where are the locations uh, for, uh, for um, value, better value for energy efficiency are as opposed to just doing a statewide approach. Um, might even involve local <coughs> private investment and financing uh, mechanisms that aren't as widely embraced uh, currently. So th those are just some of the uh, some of the delivery approaches that that we have been thinking about um, that uh, we want to try to have some conversation about today. So I'll leave it at that. Okay, great. Thank you very much. Okay, Laura. Good afternoon, and uh, I know it's a Friday afternoon, so we'll try to keep the conversation moving and uh, somewhat lively. While he is um, getting that up, I wanted to just uh, introduce my perspective. It's really about the business perspective and energy efficiency. I actually started my career working for PG&E, so I also bring um, utility perspective and working in a regulated environment for quite a while. But I've been um, in consulting. And have um, a lot of experience representing the business voice. I was also co-founder of a group in California called the Energy Efficiency Industry Council that just changed its name. Greg, you have to help me. California Efficiency Demand, Demand Management. Management Council. And that is in recognition that the world is changing, which is a bit what I want to talk about. But just from a business perspective, um, I mean, can I just get a quick show of hands? How many of you have been involved in energy efficiency for the past, you know, couple of decades? <laughs> okay. okay. Well, you know. Past couple of years. <laughs> <laughs> okay, under a decade. Let me see, under a decade. Anyway, so uh, I just didn't want to put the full 35 years on everybody. But, you know, as Greg said, I mean, there has been about 35 years of really a robust industry growing in California. Um, but if you, so those of you that said they'd been in the business for a couple decades, one of the reasons I ask that is if you think back 20 years ago or so, it was very different than it is if you think back over the past decade in efficiency. And um, one of the things that's happened in this past decade is uh, the example of how many, uh, how many states have mandates now. If you think back 2005, there are about six states that have mandates. Now, uh, or as of 2016, there were about 25 states that have mandates. So it went from this cottage industry, a lot of the businesses, can you all hear me okay, by the way? I realize I'm kind of far away from the mic. A lot of the businesses um, that were involved, uh, thinking back two decades ago, really small cottage industry, but there's been tremendous growth. And what has happened is that businesses have really thrived. So what was once this cottage industry like grew up. Um, a lot of us that have been in the industry a while talk about it that way, about how we really have gone mainstream. And through that process, there's been um, companies, lots of acquisitions. And uh, Diane mentioned in the introduction that I was a part of that acquisition. I started a, uh, was a co-founder of a company that was acquired in uh, 2011 by Clear Result. And um, I can talk a little bit about that journey. What happened was Clear Result, again, was a cottage industry coming out of some players that were involved a couple decades ago. And private equity saw what was happening in this industry. And so they approached Clear Result and said, you know, what do you think about doing a roll-up model? And anyone that's worked in private equity knows what a roll-up model is, where you bring a lot of companies together. What happened, my company was about the second in that roll-up model. And uh, it was an amazing, amazing education. As I joined, my company made the total unit about 700 people. And we acquired eight companies in uh, about four years and grew that to about 3,000 people doing work you know, all over the country. And you know, really rode that wave of you know, small business up to mainstream. Clear Result is now, I think, the largest energy efficiency company in the country doing pure just energy efficiency. So what happened is that um, 
we went not just from a business side, but in terms of creating real impacts, I think it was looked at more like social welfare type programs. Going back a couple decades ago, energy efficiency was like nobody really counted it. Nobody really believed that the savings were going to be there. And over this past decade, there, there was recognition that energy efficiency was creating meaningful impacts. Companies, the COOs, were beginning to look at the return on investment and realizing that it was impactful in their bottom line. So huge, huge decade of change. So now, um, you know, there are many changes on the horizon and, you know, Love the sort of foggy, uh, you know, where is, we actually have been talking about like bridge to the future. Well, where is this leading? And those of us that have been in the pure energy efficiency business, some companies have demand response and they are sort of on a different um, place in the curve. But for pure energy efficiency companies, there are a lot of changes, changes at play in the energy market and the market in general um, that are really making that future a bit unclear. But on the flip side of that, it's really exciting to watch energy efficiency, you know, move from that past, uh, you know, so, social welfare type program to one that really is looked at and challenged to be a real supply side resource. So I think the industry, as you think about, I think about my colleagues, you know, everybody is very excited about that. Um, and, but, you know, on the flip side, you know, there's this potential of being really a valued resource, but there's a lot of, um, you know, devil in the details, if you will, about how is energy efficiency really play in this new arena and how does it really become a valued resource? Um, so uh, let me just talk a little bit about what I see in this next decade of, you know, what I really call next decade of transition. So one of the things that uh, my colleague Greg talked about is the regulatory process. And um, there, there, right now there's a proceeding, has several different phases, that is taking energy efficiency into what we're calling rolling portfolios. Because one of the criticisms with energy efficiency over the past is it was sort of start, stop, start, stop. That's one of the reasons it really couldn't be relied on. And there was, has been significant delays in the regulatory process. Um, and to give you some example, when I uh, founded my last company, not this company, prior one in 2006, I um, bid on a, a lot of programs in California, and I think just about all those programs, maybe with the exception of one, is still operating because it's been that long since the regulatory process has really gone out to bid and brought sort of new innovative programs. So this proceeding that's been going on for the past uh, couple of years has been to really change that dynamic, you know, think more market-based, but um, the reality is that there are significant delays. One of the really huge upsides for business is that there used to be a 20% mandate. So the utilities implementing energy efficiency portfolios had to put 20% of that out to the open market to bid. In this proceeding, it's now been increased to 60%. So that's huge. I mean, the market in California uh, under the utility programs is about a billion dollars. Um, you know, Greg mentioned that the national market for energy efficiency programs, utility funded energy efficiency programs at 8 billion, about a billion of that is in California. And uh, so 60% is a huge opportunity. Um, so a lot of the businesses that have been around for a while are very much looking at that and trying to determine how they're gonna play in that. But there have been significant delays and what happens with some of the hoops Greg talked about with free riders, et cetera, is that Big industry decides they just don't want to bother with the programs. It's just too much work, and so they don't necessarily participate. And so there's lost opportunities created in that process. Um, so, you know, as we, and I'm running out of time, so I'll sort of fast forward a little bit, but as we look to the future, energy efficiency is moving from a sort of siloed, you know, resource advocacy program to one that really is thought of as a supply side resource. And so with that, you know, it comes very different ways of looking at energy efficiency rather than just resource adequacy, 
which is the way a lot of these companies design the programs. Now they have to think about, you know, location, you know, time dependent energy efficiency. These are very different skill sets. And so while the businesses, you know, there's, uh, you know, probably about 70 really active businesses that, that do implement energy efficiency programs in California, a lot of them weren't designed to operate in this way. Um, it's a very different business model. Solicitation process, financing is required. There are acceptance fees. As you start to look at energy efficiency, if it plays out as a real supply side resource, the whole procurement process is significantly different. And these companies are trying to figure out how exactly they're going to play in, uh, in that arena. Incrementality was another on there I didn't mention, but one of the ideas there that's getting a lot of conversation is if energy efficiency is being funded through utility programs, but it's also been out as a supply side resource, how do you decide where the incremental savings are? And those are, you know, really important to discern, but, you know, really challenging as well. So thinking about the future, again, I think energy efficiency has an amazing place to play in the future, but there's going to be different uh, companies that I think are going to surface or a lot of the existing companies are really going to need to look at uh, playing in this market in a very different way. The traditional programs that have been around are still going to be really important. But as Greg pointed out, they're going to have to be much more innovative. They're going to have to be designed differently if we really want to meet the 2030 goals that we're all talking about meeting. Some of the things I'm doing in other places of the country, not necessarily here in California yet, because there is such stall in the new efficiency programs, but looking at full community programs. And so there's a real transition going from these siloed market, you know, we're gonna do different programs for each market to thinking holistically. How does the market work anyway? How does energy efficiency play into that market? And thinking about, you know, aggregating through these broader markets or thinking about approaching, you know, there's the overused term that you hear about the customer journey, but really energy efficiency is just one stop along the way. People are not, companies are not going to implement energy efficiency just because it's the right thing to do. It needs to be a, a valued resource to them. And we have to integrate that into the way things normally happen in the market. So that is a really big shift that we see talked about. Um, data analytics is going to be really important. These partnerships that are going to need to come together for the programs of the future, I think are going to take real financing companies coming to the table, data analytics coming, and this idea of like acquisitions or joint ventures, I think is going to be critically important uh, for energy efficiency to really be able to be valued and to play in this new arena. So maybe during uh, discussion, love to talk about that more. Uh, so thanks for your time. And with that, I think Kurt is up next. Great. Thank you. Well, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for staying late. And uh, I'll go through this pretty quickly so we can get to the good stuff. Uh, I'm Kurt Schickman. I'm with a group called the Global Cool Cities Alliance. We're a nonprofit organization that was founded about six years ago by Art Rosenfeld. And our, our mission really is to work with cities and national governments to promote the use of cool reflective surfaces, so roofs and roads in, in an urban context, uh, to help reduce uh, urban heat island uh, uh, and, and excess urban heat. So this is just some of the cities we work with. We do that through a combination of, a, of a different methods. We do a lot of peer-to-peer -peer discussions, so cities talking to each other. We do a lot of linking of, of cities to experts of, along a wide variety of different uh, disciplines that are affected by heat. That's actually sort of the, the purpose of my talk today. Uh, we do a lot of uh, tool development to help uh, cities develop and, and implement policies and programs uh, as easily and successfully as possible. Some codes advocacy and then obviously, you know, uh, just general outreach and that sort of thing. And the reason I'm on a panel uh, on called Advanced Energy Efficiency, talking about a technology that's uh, uh, thousands of years old is that uh, <laughs> it's a little awkward, uh, but the, uh, the the issue for us is not so much the technology that, that's advanced. It's really how we have to talk about it, how we have to promote the idea of energy efficiency through a larger set of co-benefits and a conversation about a larger set of of, of uh, urban practitioners' interests. 
Uh, I'll skip this slide and move it along. So when we first started this, we really came at this from a building perspective, looking at the traditional levers of changing uh, behaviors on the building level. So things like energy codes and, and, and green codes, we still do that. Uh, and that was partially because we saw this as a, tr as a, as a major, uh, heat as a major energy issue. And this, this graph is from Washington, D.C. It just looks at uh, maximum daily temperature uh, against uh, daily load, electricity load. This is DC. I could have showed you a graph from from New York, uh, LA, you know, Miami, New Orleans. Any AC dominated city has a graph that looks like this. And basically, after about 80 degrees, you see an exponential increase in energy demand as people flip their ACs on. Cool roofs allow you to save about 20% on average uh, on your on your cooling energy demand. We see that it actually increases as the temperature goes up. And there's obviously a peak demand reduction benefit there. So that was really our first entree into this in addition to the, the global climate benefits, which were, depending on who you're talking to, the thing you either lead with or sort of keep in the back pocket. <laughs> but once you kind of extract, you know, extrapolate a little bit further back from the building and start thinking about what happens when you do this on multiple buildings in a community, or you start talking about you know, city-scale deployment, you can actually start talking about this in a much more robust way and start getting to uh, benefits and obstacles that are much more important to a city, city's leadership and much bigger impact on their economy. So this is a, a similar graph looking at air quality. So again, it's maximum daily temperature across the bottom and then uh, ozone concentrations. The red line on the horizontal is uh, EPA compliance levels at, at that time. You can see at 80 degrees pretty much every day in this location. This is actually uh, Baltimore Airport, but again, this graph looks similar most places we go. Almost every day is a clean air day. It's an it's a in compliance day. But within 10 degrees, getting up to 90, almost every day is out of compliance. So all of a sudden, you're talking about you know, bad air quality. You're talking about all kinds of ancillary health problems that people have with that, cardiopulmonary, renal disease, diabetes that are both related to heat and air quality. So now you're also talking about a social equity problem because the communities that are most affected by higher energy bills and, and lower air quality and health problems tend to be lower income communities of color. You can start talking about grid resiliency when you're talking about this scale, because you can, if you're reducing peak demand during the summer days, you're actually improving the resiliency of the grid. So it's a whole, and then across the string running through all of those is, it's now an economic question. It, it's much bigger than just saving energy at a building scale. And what we know now, based on some studies that have recently been published in the journal Nature Climate Change, is just how big the, this is when you think of it from a negative side. If we did nothing on heat, by 2100, the average city will be spending 5.6% of their uh, annual economic output, their GDP, dealing with urban heat. And the worst hit cities will be close to 11%. So more than one out of every $10 is sucked out of the economy to deal with this problem if it's not dealt with. So that starts to become something that gets mayoral and council members' attention when you start talking to them about it. Uh, so for us, uh, you know, extrapolating from the building to look at what the opportunities are for to, to impact those sort of community and city level benefits, cool roofs were also a good fit for that. Because once you start to, uh, thinking about deployment in the sort of 20% range, 20% of your roofs with a cool roof, you're looking at about a half degree reduction uh, in average temperature and about a 1.6 degree uh, reduction in peak temperature. And while that may not sound like much, if you consider that over, since the Industrial Revolution, we've had a, a full degree of global change, that's a, ha a half degree is actually starts to sound like a big number. And when you consider some of those transition zones on the previous slides in energy and air quality, a little change in temperature at the right, at the right sort of ambient outdoor temperature can be the difference between millions of dollars and lives saved. So it sounds small, but it actually uh, makes a big difference. Uh, so I guess the question then is, oh, let me back up again, I guess. The, this also translates into dollars, uh, you know, as you, you think about the solution. So I talked about the sort of negative, the cudgel of the 5.6% of your GDP going away if you do nothing. What that similar study also found was that if you invest in a modest cool roof and cool pavement program, that's again that, about that 20% uh, penetration on, on roofs, about 50% on, on roads, you actually can, the, every dollar invested in that type of program will return $12. So that's huge. So why isn't everyone doing this? Well, so th that's where we get into our big challenge, which is, uh, this is actually from a study that uh, Greg Katz from the previous, uh, uh, oh, he's in the back here, uh, that we worked on with him looking at DC. And the problem is with, with heat, we have a situation of the split incentive on steroids. You can see, the, the, and besides that, it tells you, besides my sort of 
uh, elementary school <coughs> level uh, design aesthetic, what this is telling you is, you know, the you can make the case to a building owner between the red and the blue bars there. That's the energy savings to the to the to the, uh, the building owner. So this case can be made, but it won't it won't move the market fa as fast as the urgency requires. So we have to start looking at how we recognize the benefits in that green bar. That's the full 75% of the benefits sit in that green bar, and they're hidden from the building owner. So a lot of what we try to do is help cities quantify what's in that green bar for them in a credible way so that they can take it to their decision makers, the policymakers that are looking at a whole slate of different policies that are important, and start to figure out either how to uh, internalize that in their policy making through regulation or ordinances, or shift it to that blue bar through incentives and that sort of thing. And so we've started to do that with, with some of our cities. And just a few examples, if I've got some time, I think I do. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, on, the, on the sort of incentive side, there have been you know, utility incentives for cool roofs in the past that have not really moved the market very well because they're only focused on energy savings. But in cities where we've seen them adopt incentives, like in Toronto and now in Louisville, Kentucky, uh, uh, they're significantly higher in terms of the, the, the dollars per square foot that they can offer. And they're almost immediately subscribed in both cities. The Toronto program has been around for six years, and I think they've, they've oversubscribed in, in as little as a week in, in those programs. So we're really seeing that really play both on the residential side and the uh, commercial side. Uh, Louisville just, has just started, and they were subscribed completely within two weeks. Uh, we also have folks that are out there doing uh, you know, more of the regulation and ordinance side of things, which if you want to move and transform this market, that's really the best way to do it, uh, besides the, how hard it is to actually get to that point. Uh, because we have roofs that basically turn over 5 to 7% every year, not including new buildings, but just replacement roofs, you can actually get to a substantial cool roof deployment in terms of building time scale pretty quickly. If you're trying to get to 20%, 5 to 7% a year actually gets you there fairly quickly. Uh, so we've seen cities like uh, Los Angeles, which is already operating under the pretty good Title 24 cool roof requirements, go a step further and add it for residential roofs. And then, of course, Chicago, New York, Paris, and other cities have also done this as well. So we're really starting to see that, that pick up. But one other area of interest that I, I, I've seen is outside of this sort of natural sort of building energy you know, policy mechanism, cities that have really picked up and looked at this from a completely different perspective. In New York, last week, they just announced a $106 million investment in their urban heat island mitigation uh, programs. They've, they've been around for a while. They've actually, they're going to be amping them up to a huge degree. And they're based, they're, none of, none of the, the decision-making process has been made around energy. It was social equity issues in South Bronx and other communities. It was health opportunities. And it was, the, it was expanding an existing jobs program that's graduating over 100 people a year who weren't employable before but are now working in the city with good jobs. That's what generated 100, which $106 million in the sort of venture capital Silicon Valley world is maybe not that much. But for those of us working in city policy, that's a tremendous amount of money. Um, <laughs> And so th these are the those types of programs that are justifying energy efficiency, what are at their core energy efficiency investments through completely different means, uh, I think is really critical for us. And so we're, we're really trying to work on how we can get uh, the benefits in the green uh, more recognized by cities and accepted by cities uh, uh, so that we can really move this uh, urban heat island mitigation uh, activity at, a, at the rate of urgency that it requires. So thanks very much. Great. Thank you. So um, I've got one general question that I'm going to po pose and uh, pose to the panel, and then we're going to open it up for questions. If you all don't have questions, I've got many more up my uh, sleeve. But this panel is about innovation, and um, it, we probably should have given the caveat at the beginning. It's not necessarily innovation in technology, for energy efficiency, I mean, that's very, very important, but we're trying to think about, um, in order to move the needle on energy efficiency, which all studies on climate change say we've got to do, um, how can we think more about innovation in terms of um, delivery of programs, in terms of um, who's involved, what type of partnerships we have, even um, literally, what do we think about when we think about programs and how can we couple it with um, what Kurt just talked so eloquently about is, well, maybe it's not just dollar savings. Maybe that's not really gonna move the market if we can think about 
who's interested in these areas like local cities and a broader perspective of interest beyond just sort of our traditional energy savings. So my question to each of you is, I've now magically appointed with my magic wand your czar of uh, your particular world. And um, you heard a bit about the constraints are for energy efficiency, a lot of it has operated within um, a very strict regulatory structure because the original concept when we first started it 40 years ago was it would be delivered by utilities because the concept was you would do energy efficiency instead of building power plants. And so we still have this construct that developed 40 years ago about sort of it's our utilities who are major deliverers of um, energy efficiency. And because a lot of it comes from um, charges on their customer bills, we have to be very, very precise about where the money is spent and not waste it, which makes sense. But it's a very different paradigm, for example, from what we've done on the renewable side, which is we've set a goal of we're going to have, you know, 20% an RPS renewable portfolio standard, or we're going to have some level of distributed generation. And while the payments for that may come through charges on the bill, we haven't made it utility centric. We've said we want to embrace the private sector. Um, and when I say the private sector, I do include local government. We want to you know, have something outside of a monopoly uh, construct. So my question to you is, okay, you have become, you know, supreme decision maker in your area, unlimited by this sort of 40-year history of very stringent regulatory requirements. Um, what do you think are the one, maybe two, most significant things that you would undertake um, now that you've got freedom to start to move in a direction you think, and, and how would that change things? Whoever wants to start first. Well, well, I'll, I'll be happy to start. <laughs> um, boy, that's a, that's a fun question. Yeah. Um, so I'll stick with my little world right now, which is uh, energy efficiency policy in California. So uh, my, my uh, wish is to be the czar uh, over at uh, Van Ness and McAllister Street in San Francisco is to go to the CPUC and basically tell them, <laughs> you guys are going to adopt the aggressive scenario for energy efficiency uh, that was laid out in the potential study as a starting point. And so that's a that's a pretty uh, that's a pretty tall order for the CPUC um, to handle. I think it can be done. In fact, we can do this. We uh, we have proven that we've we've been able to meet significant challenges in our past uh, in terms of uh, bringing energy efficiency up to a, a, a high level of performance. Um, and uh, I know we can actually increase it, but we're going to have to change policies, as I sort of alluded to in my presentation. We have barriers in place right now that are very policy centric. So as, as, as the czar, I'm gonna basically um, uh, identify uh, uh, several areas where the, the PUC could remove barriers and thus in, in open up the floodgates, if you will, of, uh, of more efficiency. And it's say that aggressive scenario of 1.2% reduction by 2030, I'd say that that would be our starting point, um, that we should really be targeting a bit of a higher uh, standard that would essentially put us in line to meet our commitments, um, our goals uh, as part of SB 350. So that's my that's my wish. Great. Well, I have to jump on that. I'm very excited about this new world that Greg <laughs> is creating. And um, from a business perspective, one of the things that's been so frustrating is how siloed all the various pots of funding are. So as an example, when you are on site as a business implementing a program. Um, I remember we had a school energy efficiency program we were implementing, for example, and that was all we could do was focus on the energy efficiency improvements at the school. We couldn't look at the water savings with all the urinals and, you know, so it, renewables at that time. And, you know, again, it had to do with the policies. Um, so, you know, we actually did get a pilot approved once to go out and look at everything together and what a tremendous difference it made, not just from a, the standpoint of the various resources out there, but also from the standpoint of the market players. There were, 
teachers, there were facility managers, there were kids that went home to the residents at home, and there were barriers as to the various services we could provide. There was this chance to holistically do it all, hit all these markets, hit all these resources. And the policy barriers and the siloed <laughs> way that money flows impeded that. So uh, I guess th my, you know, being the czar, I would love to see barriers removed for us to see what could we really do if we could think about this the way that business looks at challenges without the policy barriers. And having been fairly involved in the private equity arena and seeing how that world works over the past five to 10 years, you know, there is a way to make things happen, just different resources, different energy comes, and, and people blow goals out of the water, like the kind that Greg's talking about. So that's my happy moment. Kurt. I guess I would say, uh, just in keeping with my kind of basic comments that we need to be better about capturing co-benefits, I would probably compel the uh, insurance and reinsurance industries to come to the table to help develop a credible set of ways to measure this. Because they're the industry, in my mind, that is a globally uh, available. The, the, the issues we have in Dar es Salaam and Auckland are going to be the same as we have here in terms of that market. And they're the ones that are going to have to accept the way we develop those methodologies uh, uh, if we're going to find any substantial funding moving into that space or any substantial sort of private sector money moving into that space to support what the governments are doing. Because that's obviously not always the best, uh, most uh, uh, consistent money in the world, especially at the city level. So that would be my my hope, and I do appreciate you uh, uh, embracing our new overlords by calling us czars. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, let's open it up to questions. Just come on up to the mic, and I would ask you to give your name and if you are with an organization, your affiliation. Hi, uh, Jeff Alfs. I'm with Peninsula Clean Energy. We're the CCA provider for San Mateo County. Um, the most interesting thing, one of the most interesting things I've seen recently, or potential things, is uh, pay for performance. The pilot programs now that are coming from PG&E. My question is, how much impact do you think that will have on energy efficiency? What are the potential challenges of it from an administrative standpoint? And can we can we factor social benefits into a pay for performance scheme statewide? Um, well, um, so the pay for performance that you're talking about, I think, are the residential pilots that are out there right now. Um, so I did look at that solicitation, and um, you know, I also talked with several organizations that looked at that solicitation. And honestly, and organizations that have the software and the technical tools to deal with it, and they they did not even want to play. So I, you know, I, I, that's not much of an answer, but my initial reaction is how much is that going to change it? I, I think that there are a lot of um, barriers and I think it had to do with the way that those uh, RFPs were written as well for companies. However, it is the nut we have to crack. So, you know, I, I guess, you know, again, that's not much of an answer, but um, somehow we have to get to the point where we really can show what the savings are out there, and we have to be able to, to compare it to sort of prior and post installation. So Greg, one minute before you jump in, because I want to hear it, but I'm now giving back that magic wand, and you do get to design a pay-for performance program um, with Greg's goal of Let's think big about what could, we could accomplish. Could you do that if you if you were given? I mean, in other words, can we really design a pay for performance that would work from companies' viewpoints who want to be running them and making a return on it, and customers' viewpoints to get them to participate? Can it be done? Well, so the term pay for performance also, I should just stop by defining that because I think that means a lot of different things to a lot of different people. So for example, the, the contracts right now that utilities uh, execute with implementers, those are considered pay for performance from the standpoint of you get paid once you deliver um, energy savings that then go through EM&V process. Um, however, if you know, that there's no risk post EM and V to the implementer. So there are those kind of pay for performances out there right now. And those work quite well. I think you can push a lot of risk onto the implementers. If 
you allow them to operate like a real business. But one of the things that has happened is that a risky contract like that will be put out. And then at the same time, they, the utilities have tried to treat it like a time of materials. They change it. They want to see information that in private industry, you never would ask to see. So if pay performance is put out there to businesses, I think my colleagues at business would say, let us compete the way private businesses compete. That's one thing. But back to this gentleman's question about that particular pay for performance, that one was very specific to meter. If I have the one you're talking about, correct, this was specific to, you know, metered, um, savings. And I think there was so much risk put on the implementers for that project, you know, that, that the, it was essentially a, an, a experiment and they asked people to bid on it and to carry all the risk for it. So that, that is what I understood about it. And again, I've not been involved day to day, but I, I think that you need to, you know, treat it that way, invest in it so that like we as a community can figure out we have to crack this nut, but we can't do it by, you know, asking businesses to take all the risk. And I'll, I'll just add that I think that the biggest issue is that the payment um, terms are really predicated on measured performance after a period of time. And yeah. that's a problem for, for customers because they would have to make the initial invest. Somebody has to make the investment to put the equipment in. Um, and uh, customers aren't going to wait um, to get any pay payment or reimbursement for their investments vis-a-vis -vis their incentives. Um, so who, who takes that risk? Um, or is that policy reasonable? In the current paradigm, we have a, a, a foundational approach that is essentially saying we deem uh, estimates of savings up front, and the rules should not change, uh, as you suggested, Lauren, over the time frame of that, of that uh, uh, um, implementation experience. If that sort of mindset comes back and we can get greater confidence in our estimated savings up front, that that should be that 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 approach should should really help um, pay for performance uh, take off. I think mm -hmm. yeah. the market will respond, and it has in the past. Yeah, set clear, consistent rules is sort of our mantra, and then let business play. Let them come to the table. Okay. Any other questions? Just come right up. Just identify yourself, please. <laughs> yeah, uh, Bruce Nagel from. Uh, Sustainable Silicon Valley and uh, Carbon Free Silicon Valley, which is the group that advocated for the uh, CCE in uh, Santa Clara County. A um, couple comments. First off, one is the benefits have got to flow back to the people who pay the bills. One of the things that I saw that was, we're, a number of us who were in some of these groups are working to try to figure out how to get heat pumps in. Heat pumps are the next big thing to, in, in order to be able to move from uh, from gas to electricity. We've got to stop burning gas. So one of the things that, it, that we were looking at as a program, we haven't found quite the right one yet because the efficiency isn't quite there, is something called pay-as-you-save, where the, the payments go right back to the, the people who own it. Now, the one that I saw that was workable because of the fact that it actually went back to the owner of the business was one that was done in Hayward, and it was related to water savings. And what they do is they, because... Uh, apartments are done with a central water facility. There aren't separate water meters inside of them. The, the savings went back to the owner, which is great. But we also have to figure out how to do it for the people who, you know, who, who would uh, install things for saving electricity in their homes. Mm -hmm. And so we, we've got to figure that one out. The other part that I'm concerned about, and I'd love to hear, and maybe not this, but a, some side discussion about how you guys actually measured the efficiency and how much you actually got for some of these things because the challenges in some cases is the things are not there. Example, in this mild climate, you're not going to get a good return on double pane windows. You know, it'll be 20 or 30 years. And the only thing that I've heard people say, and it's a couple of people have said this, is that the comfort improves. It, you know, I don't have these cold spots. So we've got to figure out how to make those tangible in order to make that work. But, but in a lot of cases, you know, if we're going to meet the goals, We've got to get an awful lot of energy out of this, which means I don't know how we're going to make these business these things as efficient as they need to be, given that we have a mild climate. 
So I don't, I don't know how anybody can answer some of these things, but I think at some point we've got to get to, we've got this level of efficiency and we know we can actually reduce the, the energy load by this amount. And Kurt, you were the only one to talk numbers. <laughs> okay. okay. So I'll leave it at that. Yeah. Um, you want to take a stab first? Yeah, and I, I'd actually build on Kurt's uh, one of his slides. So I'd take exception. I had numbers too. But <laughs> <laughs> well, we didn't have the slides up when you. <laughs> um, but it, it, you know, I think it does go back to are we counting all the benefits uh, of energy efficiency right now in the current policies? You know, we use a, what's called a total resource cost test which is really, uh, you know, not reflective of what we all know is um, that blue, or the green, the green bar that you had in your chart so nicely uh, laid out, which is there are more benefits out there than just avoiding, you know, uh, the construction of new power plants. Um, there's benefits to society as a result of avoided carbon, which, you know, easily, um, you know, make, make the argument for measures that would have normally not pass the economic screen, like double pane windows, like mm -hmm. wall, even wall insulation, uh, other measures that were on the margins that when we tested it out using a carbon adder, $250 a ton in our models, which is what is uh, being discussed as, the, uh, as, as sort of that representative value for carbon, um, it, it really changed the landscape for a lot of energy efficiency. And that's where I think we need to go policy-wise and say, you know, we've got to change the, 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 the calculation, the, the, the viewpoint of what constitutes um, benefits. Did either of you want to add anything? Kurt, you have anything? No, that was great. Yeah, I liked the green, too. I, I guess just my, my one comment about the, the, the um, customers contributing is that I think if we, we were able to implement these programs, so like customers would pay for a lot of these things. So you can invest in an overall project. Customers would put more money towards it, I think, if we designed them differently because there is value. But they shouldn't necessarily go into the energy efficiency funding. Well, it's, there's a comment on that. Look at what happened when we changed the financing model to solar. Okay. Uh, we may have to take that discussion <laughs> that offline is, since we're yeah. not doing the solar finance yet. Yes. Hi, um, Ami Amarnath from EPRI. Um, let me ask two very separate questions. Uh, the first question is, uh, any comments from the panelists on uh, pricing, real-time pricing and effects of, of that on energy efficiency? Question one. The second question is something very different that uh, I've been hearing more lately, and that is, uh, somebody mentioned this water efficiency, you know, uh, related to water and energy efficiency, what is called as a water energy <coughs> nexus. Mm -hmm. And the startling information that I've heard is that uh, these are coming from the water agencies in the country saying that if we were to save water that is currently being discarded or wasted, the amount of energy that would save, that that uh, saving of water would, would save, is more than the energy efficiency programs in the country, the $8 billion that you're talking about. So that's a very startling statement, mm -hmm. but I, I wonder if, mm -hmm. uh, if anybody wanted mm -hmm. to comment on that, the water energy mm -hmm. nexus and the real-time pricing. I, I could do a quick comment on the water efficiency because I worked in water efficiency programs for quite a while. And uh, I, I have to say that it, it currently there are tremendous barriers to integrating water efficiency in many cases they're still not even fully metered, as you might know. And if you look at that industry, what I found is it was, you know, about like the energy efficiency industry a decade or two ago. Now, that, that is a broad statement. That's not 100% true. But I think there is so, so much potential there. And I think we can apply so many lessons learned from this industry. And uh, I think it is a, you know, a huge opportunity. And I don't see a lot of real solutions coming. So I would put that on the, we need another czar for that one. <laughs> so uh, next year we'll be back. Okay. With yes. Uh, Ami, I'll re re reply to the, uh, the, the pricing questions. That's a topic that's near and dear to my heart is, um, you know, right now we don't have good price signals that are being sent to customers. We're not necessarily in se uh, sending the signal to essentially um, be efficient. Um, and so, you know, the move toward real-time pricing or even, I mean, let's just go basic here. Let's talk about time of use. 
you know, if we actually got a, a, a default time of use tariff in place here in the state, which is I know we're trending toward, but there's going to be a lot of customer pushback. But if we did that, we would see a lot of energy savings right off the bat because of behavior change. We tried to model some of that in our study, but uh, you know, we, live, we still live in these little silos. So energy efficiency proceeding is supposed to look at energy efficiency measures, which now include behavior. So arguably, price response could fit into that, but technically speaking, price response goes into another proceeding at the CPUC, which is demand response. So if I were to put my czar hat back on, I probably would say we need to look at a broad, comprehensive overview that you know it encompasses energy efficiency encompasses a, a broad um, array of options, including price reform, tariff reform, real-time pricing, using these these um, meters, these smart meters that we have in place, you know, eight million or whatever, however many we have in California that we've spent a lot of money on. Uh, use the functionality of those meters to set the right price signals, send the right price signals to encourage conservation. Okay. Um, I have in my program that we're supposed to end at 340, which was two minutes ago. Nobody has stopped us, but um, in consideration of people having time before the um, main next and last big session, which we'll start at four, I think we're going to have to wrap it up. So please join me in thanking our panelists. <laughs>